Guys, I own Alibaba stock. I'm going to go through why I own it and why I think there's a potential 662% return potential in the next 10 years. Now, keep in mind, this is based on my rosiest assumptions, but whenever you're valuing a company, you need to come with base case and best case scenarios. And my 662% potential return is based on best case, but there are a lot of hurdles along the way and a lot of issues with China, which I think explains why Baba is selling so low right now relative to its all-time high. So before we get into the 662%, let's talk about the story behind Baba and why it has some amazing potential and why I think the market is mispricing this company. Now, Baba is currently selling at $71 per share. However, if you look right here, Baba's all-time high is $319 a share back in 2020, almost four years ago, three and a half years ago, $319 per share. Mo, do you remember back then when we were looking at Alibaba? We were interested, but we sat there and said, one, it's overpriced, but two, what was our biggest reason why we didn't own it? It was in China. It was overpriced yeah. and in China. Yes, yeah, so we were a little concerned about China. We were like, listen, I don't think the juice is worth the squeeze. We don't understand China enough to really make it worthwhile. And then the stock started to plummet. And when it starts to plummet, you can get rid of a lot of those concerns, or at least those concerns can be factored in. It hit a low of $58 per share in recent years. And now it's sitting around the low 70s. It's been hanging around there for a while. Now, it's a $181 billion market cap. That means if you bought all the shares outstanding, you'd spend $181 billion buying it. And look at those guys. Enterprise value of $190 billion. This difference right here is essentially their debt. It's around $8 billion. But look at this, Mo. Last year, their free cash flow was $26 billion. The last five years, flow. their average free cash flow is $19.5 billion. This yeah. $9 billion is nothing. This company has a great balance sheet. Remember, guys, this is extremely important. Great balance sheet companies, it's hard for them to go under when times get tough. And guess what? Times eventually get tough. Another big key here is look at how different the free cash flow is to the net income. Significant difference in a good way. We want free cash flow greater than net income, and we have that here. In fact, in the last year, it's almost double the free cash flow versus the net income. Now, guys, when people buy a stock, they buy it for one reason and one reason only. Mo, what is that reason? To make money. That's it. So, Mo, who is buying Alibaba right now? So, we have David Tepper, Michael Burry. This is an interesting one here. Jack Ma, who is the founder of Alibaba. He made a purchase of uh, $50 million. Joseph Tsai bought $150 million. Ray Dalio. Dalio has been interested in China for quite some time. No disclosure of what he's bought. But those are some pretty big names that you're seeing getting involved with this. Now, I'm sure there are some disclosures about Ray Dalio now. But you're right, Mo. I'm sure. These are... Great investors. Now, keep in mind, guys, don't ever buy a company just because a great investor did. The example I always give is Berkshire Hathaway, who we respect immensely, owned Verizon stock a few years ago. And Mo and I would literally make videos going, we don't see it. We can't see it. We didn't just ride their coattails. Do we look at them for ideas? Absolutely. But we don't just sit there and grab hold. And if you remember, Charlie Munger and a friend of the channel, Guy Spear, bought Alibaba in the 200s. Munger ended up saying it was the biggest mistake he made from the standpoint of his evaluation of the company. He thought it was more tech than retail, ended up being more retail than tech, but he still owns half his position. And the first 300,000 shares that he sold was, mere, was purely done for a tax loss harvest. But I especially love that Jack Ma, the founder, and Joseph Tsai, the chairman, have made $200 million worth of purchases on that. And in the first quarter of this year, Mo, how much did Alibaba buy back of its own shares? So in the first quarter, they bought back $4.8 billion worth of shares. That is almost 3%. That's two and a half, two and two thirds percent of their shares outstanding just in the first quarter. And I'm pretty sure they have a pretty nice buyback program in place. They do in the tens of billions. Guys, yep. when a company buys back their shares strategically and you look at Alibaba, the thing I love about them, they were buying shares back at the, at the right time. They weren't buying back at $300 a share. They waited a while and that's what's great. Now, let's check out some data on Alibaba's revenue growth potential. Now, here is their e-commerce sales. The, the, the light blue is the China e-commerce International is the dark blue. So there's been some slowdown here. But remember, they were still big on the COVID shutdowns. They did another COVID shutdown. It was kind of, China's economy has stagnated from that perspective. But look at international. 
And this is all in millions of won. And I think it's about seven to one. But look at this growth internationally. 4 billion, 4.8, 6.5, 7.6, 13.3, 20.8, 27.7, 33.9, 48.8, 61.69 $61 billion won. Again, this is about $10 billion in US dollars for international. Now here it's slowed down a little bit, understood. But the point is, why would it go internationally and not in China? They do have more competition. PDD, JD, there is more competition in China. I will not deny that. But I love seeing this growth internationally. And I think once China's coming back around to seeing some growth. In fact, the Chinese manufacturing index that hit a 13-month high recently because they started to reopen their doors and things were a lot more open than they were before because they were so worried about COVID. Another big reason I'm bullish on China. Guys, this is China per capita GDP by year going back to 1985. Been a little stagnant here, and this is the growth potential according to estimates to 2028. Quite the leap, but guys, we went from you know, literally back in, let's look at it this way back in 2007, they were at $2,500 per person, and now they're at $12,500 per person. That's, That's insane. That's 5x growth in a matter of 17 years. Compare that to the U.S. The U.S. is probably up 30 or 40% in that time. Now, one downside is China is losing population. Their one-child policy decades ago have really started to hurt them. They are declining in people. But remember, even though they're declining in people, people are becoming wealthier and wealthier and wealthier. And that's what's important here. The, or the, the, the efficiency per worker and the income per worker is increasing drastically. Fastest growing middle class in the world. Probably going to be overtaken by India at some point here soon, wouldn't you think, Mo? Because India is growing like crazy and they're a smaller economy per capita, so they have a lot more growth potential. Yeah, that's true. I think that's absolutely true. Now, remember the big fear about Alibaba to start with a thing called ADRs? which meant basically you didn't actually own shares of the company here in the U.S. And people made a big stink about it, to which I said, that's always been the case. It was, always yeah, been it was the funny. case. It was funny when it was $319 a share back in uh, October 2020. Nobody talked about that. But when the stock price started falling, everybody started talking about it. What does that mean? News follows the stock price, not the other way around. Mo called Charles Schwab. I called Merrill Lynch and said, listen, I own Baba shares. What happens if... They delist from the U.S. They said, well, you'll just get shares in Hong Kong and we will just have to take, if you ever want to liquidate, it might just take a couple weeks to get your money. I was like, oh, that's it? They're like, yeah, that's it. So I was like, okay, I'm good with that risk. Now, another big risk was China invading Taiwan. Guys, don't get me wrong. There are issues with China. I'm not trying to make that to be like it's nothing. There are issues. The question is, is the stock price cheap enough to justify those issues? Is the juice worth the squeeze there? That is the question there. Now, this whole China invading Taiwan really hasn't come to much fruition lately. Doesn't mean it won't happen, but I think it's been kind of over. Again, it was the talk of the town just six or nine months ago. Now it hasn't really been talked about much. Mo, you're smiling because you know exactly. Listen, so I just don't hear. I used to hear, every time I would open up the news, it would be that. Now I don't see it at all. Just like ADRs was the news before that one. It was like, you don't get it, guys. You don't actually own the, the, yeah, I get it. I understand that. We have an access to the free cash. We don't actually own shares of the company. I get that. But again, news follows the stock price. It's not like that was a new thing that happened about the ADRs. It was not a new thing. It's always been the case. Now, guys, again, as we discussed, this is, this is Alibaba's quarterly revenue. And you saw some consistent growth and then stagnation. But again, when did that stagnation happen? 2020, 2021. Guys, it was COVID. Again, not to say it's, what was that, Mo? It was self-created basically by their COVID zero policy. Yeah, just like our, just like we talked about with airlines and cruise lines and things like that when COVID shut down. And just like we warned about Clorox, don't just go buy Clorox because of this. It was hyped company because sales skyrocketed. You have to remember that there can be a story to justify a price or some sort of action and revenue. We think that's the story here. We look at China saying twelve, thirteen thousand dollars per person in GDP and growing. What's going to happen to Alibaba's revenue being the number one retailer, e-commerce retailer in in China? It's likely to continue to go up. Now, a lot of people said this is the opportunity of a lifetime, etc. I'm not going to get into that. I'm not going to even justify that. What I'd say is, based on those things right now, if I had thirty companies that were large companies that were hundred billion dollar companies that I could buy that fit that criteria that was similar to that, that would be very attractive. But the question is, 
Is it still worth it? What about that 662% that I talked about? Is that justifiable? Because remember, guys, to get 662% return on your money over the next 10 years, and by the way, I didn't even factor in share repurchases. Ooh, that right. factors in no share repurchases there. That's a lot of potential. So guys, if you bought Alibaba right here, $319 a share, this is scary. Remember, a lot of investors we love started buying right here. This is scary. Peter Lynch has always said, I bought stocks at 12, then went to two, and then went to 50. Remember, this does not tell you you're wrong. Just like if the stock went like this, it doesn't tell you you're right necessarily. What matters is your process. And we use our tools to figure out the fundamentals of the business so you can make the right purchasing process. But what's most important and what's going to make you the most money is having the good emotional fortitude to sit there and withstand the ups and downs in the market. That is what's hardest about investment. Because the longer you hold a company and let it compound, the better you will do. All the greatest investors did very well by letting things compound. Munger and Buffett always talk about that. They said, listen, the vast majority of our investments did about average and okay. Where we made our killing was being patient and waiting. And being able to do that's very difficult. We've all been there when we see a stock fall and we get emotional about it. We get worried. Is the stock going to zero? Is the market going to zero? We cannot deny we've had that. I've had those thoughts before. I still get those thoughts when I see a stock go against me. So what do I do? I go back to the fundamentals to ground myself and I go into our community. And that's exactly why I created the community to give people an avenue where they could just be with others who are like-minded. Investing can be a lonely road. It can suck, but with like-minded investors that you can talk to, you can make better decisions as you hold a company. And that might actually mean that you realize you were wrong and you sell the company before it goes down further. Take your loss and move on. But you're gonna make the most money by holding on and being patient because every company goes through ups and downs. Berkshire Hathaway has fallen 50% multiple times in the last 50 years. Apple fell 50% how many times? This is part of the game. But what's important is making the right fundamental decisions and holding on to it. That takes emotional fortitude. So if you're interested in making less emotional, disastrous decisions, join the community, click the link below. It's $7 for seven days. I highly encourage it. And make sure you do it soon because we're going to have a wait list soon. We're going to limit the number of people entering the community on a daily basis. So again, click the link below, $7 for seven days. Now, let's check out and see what the analysts are saying because guys, analysts are going to follow the market. But let's go see what they're saying for EPS. Look at this. $9 a share, not much growth to 1064. And by the way, these are the most pessimistic outcomes I've seen over the last few years. But even at, 10, even at $10 a share, that means the company is selling for a seven PE right now. And you saw the price of free cash flow was about six right now. It's very, very cheap. Now, does that mean it can't get cheaper? No, but if I told you right now, you could buy a company for six times free cash flow with the cash flow growing, how would you feel about that? Oh, how would happy. you feel about that? If you, bought, that one. And if you bought 30 companies like that, where they're well, buying back the shares. Yeah, that's the you, thing. If, maybe if it's just one isolated event, eh, but if I look at it and say, yeah, I can buy 30 this way, I'm buying all 30. By the way, even one isolated event, you should still make that bet if you feel comfortable with the investment because this could end up not working out. Absolutely. There's a thousand things that can go wrong in this. But again, you're playing the odds here. Let's look at the revenue growth. Look at this revenue growth, Mo. High single digits, yeah. $133 billion to $174 billion in revenue growth. That's incredible. So now we get to our point about where I can explain to you the 662%. Let's pull up Stock Analyzer tool and the last time I did Alibaba stock. Now, Mo, if you look here, let me make it a little bit bigger so everybody can see it a little bit better. I did a 10-year analysis. My low revenue growth assumptions for the next 10 years was 3%. My high was 9% average of the middle. Keep in mind, guys, analysts were expecting about the 9% level for the next five or six years. So right. I'm going that high on the highest level for 10 years. Now, profit margin, I did 15, 19, and 23%. And if you look here, the free cash flow has been better. So I did 17, 22, and 27. I assumed 27 on the high side because of their cloud business. High margin business, cloud business can grow that a lot, right? How do you feel about that, Mo? I have the same numbers in my uh, stock analyzer on my screen right now. Great. Now for PE, what'd you put for your 10 year from now PE and price of free cash flow? So I did 16, 18 and 20. And honestly, that's what I, I did because they are like the almost Amazon of the retail world over there. You can maybe justify a little bit higher, but I think I'm going to stick with 16, 18 and 20. 
Yep, I agree. And uh, that's factoring in a little bit of risk involved. And for my desired yep. return, Mo, I'm just doing the market return of 9%. So this is no okay. margin of safety. And remember, we need margin of safety because as Seth Carman says, there are three things why we need margin of safety. One, the future is unknown. Two, valuation is an imprecise art. We don't know exactly to the penny what something is worth. And three, we're humans. We make mistakes and we're going to make mistakes. Alibaba could be a mistake. Absolutely could be a mistake. There's something that I don't see in China that could be absolutely disastrous. The company could stop growing. But the point is, that's the reason why you need margin of safety. But based on a 9% return, let's look at it this way. I'm going to do the math for you real quick. So last year, Alibaba did $120 billion of revenue. If we assume 9% growth for 10 years, that's times 1.09 to the 10th power, takes us to about $285 billion in revenue in 10 years. Okay, not bad. Now, if you remember, I, I factored in free cash flow of 27%. So if the cash flow here is 27% of 285, that equates out to $77 billion in free cash flow. 77 billion. Now, I assign that multiple of 18. And what do we have as a market cap? That market cap is around $1.4 trillion in market cap in 10 years. It's currently at 180 billion. So that's equal to 0.18 trillion. And that is a total return of roughly 7.62 minus one is 662%. That is how I get to my 662% return. But that is based on most optimistic assumptions. And that's why you need that margin of safety because 662% return annualized is over 10 years is roughly 20.8% per year. Is that enough margin of safety? You need to decide that. But remember guys, join the community below because you need to make your own decisions in investing and get the support of the community on the emotional side. If you want to see the 13, the 12 other companies I own, watch our next video and we'll take you there. Thank you guys for your time.